Hey everyone, Irene Lyon here. Welcome to this entire world of nervous system health and healing. Before I introduce the conversation that I have for you today with Kate Cavanaugh, I want to make sure you know that I have got a website with so much information, resources and eBooks and audio samplers and classes. And of course my online courses that have been used and experienced by thousands of people all around the world. I think we've got over 90 countries, people from over 90 countries who've gone through my many offerings and courses. So be sure to check that out. Just my name, irenelion.com. Check that out. We are going into here, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, what one considers summer break. Um, my team and I will still be sending out information into the YouTube world and via email each and every week. I will be taking a little bit of a breather during the months of July and August, so no formal teaching, no live streams. So if you're finding me now and you're new here, just know there's so much that you can start with over these summer months in the Northern Hemisphere. And then we will be opening up registration again for Smart Body, Smart Mind. This is my 12-week online nervous system rewire course um, in September. So all the information for this is also below uh, this video, wherever you're listening or watching this, and all that information also on my website. So be sure to check that out if you are not aware of what Smart Body, Smart Mind is. Today, I have a conversation. This isn't really an interview, although we might consider it an interview. As you can see, it is a long form conversation with my good friend, a fellow uh, producer of content and interview interviews, Kate Cavanaugh. Kate and I met via a mutual connection in the online podcast space, and we've just really connected over a mutual love of regeneration healing and restoring not only the human system but our planetary earth our earth system into better harmony better flow better health so in our talk today we talk about what she does where she's come from her her trauma story her nervous system story what led her to want to get into the world of regenerative farming out of all things in the world, that's where she is, that's what she does right now. And also her journey as a child being diagnosed with a few things that one might consider to be a life sentence, but as we talk about in this conversation, they have not been. She's done a lot of work to heal and restore and regenerate her body, her mind, her soul, and of course in her world, um, the soil around her and how she works on the land with her, her farm and her husband. I hope that you check her out and be sure to find her, her podcast. It's called the Mind Body Soil Podcast. More long form conversations with experts, not just about farming, things like death, things like how we connect to self, how we connect to the world around us, um, all sorts of really great topics. So I hope you connect with her after you've had a chance to listen to our conversation. And the other thing I do want to mention, you might be wondering why am I putting out such a long conversation? And we talk about this towards the end of our talk, how important it is we feel to have long conversations, to really dive deep and connect with another person and to share those connections with others. Um, I understand that we're in a world right now where things are fast and quick and you want a soundbite. And of course, this is not for that. This is for you to really sink in and of course, get to know her and listen to our interaction. I hope you find some good information, education and inspiration from this discussion. I certainly did. And I have no doubt that her and I will have more discussions in the future. Take good care and enjoy this long Form Talk with Kate Cavanaugh. Hi, Irene. It's such a pleasure to be here. Ditto. And as um, we were talking about a second ago, we, we already talked about 20 minutes before we hit record here. So plenty to talk about. Yes. I, I have a running joke that some of the best podcasts that I do happen before or after I hit record. <laughs> I agree. I agree. 
I agree. And so with that, um, we want to talk about healing today. And I originally met you, obviously, through the internet world via mm-hmm. Sarah Kleiner, mutual friend, podcast person. And I loved your story. Mm-hmm. And I would love if you could just tell people who you are, where you are, what you do, and then we'll just piece together your story from childhood, it sounds like we might get into into where you are yeah. today. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about needing some of that childhood story sometimes as a reference point. But my name is Kate Kavanaugh, and I am a farmer, a butcher, the host of the Mind, Body, and Soil podcast, and just somebody who who loves having conversation and being in nature. And I've, I've been a butcher for the last 13 or 14 years, mm-hmm. uh, just part of a journey that took me from being a vegetarian into eating meat. And I have been a farmer for the past five years. Mm-hmm. And I also work as a nutrition therapist. And so I, my real goal in life is to sort of bridge health of land and health of bodies and to explore what it means to be humans woven into this earth. Super. What I want to address, let's just talk about the elephant in the room. We're not having this conversation today to convince anyone that they (laughs) must eat meat. It's not about that. No, not at all. Um, But you do. And what turned you or what shifted you from being a vegetarian for, I think it was a very long time, it was. And you're, I mean, let's be honest, this is extreme to go from that to being a full on butcher where you are teaching people. Is it butchery? Is that the right term? Or, yeah, term? we we <clears throat> teach people butchery. We also teach people how to move through on farm processing. Mm-hmm. And, and so the the slaughtering of animals on farm and teach people some about biology as Mm -hmm. you get to see it reflected in an animal's body, getting to see fascia, getting to see muscles and tendons and ligaments really in action. Yeah. I saw that in anatomy class when I was in university. Um, And it's interesting because I recently caught a video of you teaching in Texas. And it was just so lovely to hear someone else talking about anatomy from that perspective Mm -hmm. and understanding it. And it just, it seems like an amazing art form, not something that I think I would ever want to go into, um, but I honor it because I grew up with farmers and people that hunted and fished and all these things. And I'm quite ignorant to how I would process something like that. So it's commendable. One of the things I like to tell people is that we are one of 40,000 generations of hunters. And so I think that there's something that's built into us that has knowledge of that, Mm -hmm. that has been passed throughout time. And I think that for anybody who is curious, and again, that's not going to be everybody, there is this beautiful opportunity to kind of get to see how some of these systems that you talk about so often, how, how fascia interconnects this web throughout the body and, and to kind of see that firsthand and to see your biology reflected in another being is, can be a powerful experience. It is. And it reminds me, um, you know, when I was in my Feldenkrais training, which is one of the things that I did for about four years, learning how to work with really, it was the skeleton um, and the movements of the skeleton, developmental movement, human movement, some of the things that you've experienced um, through going through my courses, which you have. Um, I remember one day we were playing and sitting um, like on hard stools. And we were learning about the pelvis Mm -hmm. and the sit bones, so the ischia. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the pieces was to get our hands under to sit. And it's hard on on a stool. It squishes your finger, right? Yeah. But to feel the roundness and how big that... Ischial tuberosity. Yeah, that tuberosity is. (laughs) 
And um, I didn't think much of it because I had been an athlete and grew up in an animal hospital seeing x-rays. And so I knew what was in the body pretty darn well. And I was trained in exercise science and did anatomy and all that. But I remember there was um, a few people in the class, Kate, who got viscerally nauseous. Mm. Like they wanted to vomit when they felt their own bone to that degree. Oh, interesting. And I've never forgotten that because at that point, I didn't understand trauma and the nervous system to the degree that I do now. But what I now know is they had never, they were disconnected from their body. Mm -hmm. They're in this amazing mind body training. And yet they actually don't have a connection to it at that visceral level. And that was so visceral to feel that skeleton from the inside, yeah. very different than touching your finger bones. Um, it's the same reason some people faint when they see blood. Yes. It's interesting. And I, I want to lead into this gently because it's definitely, I think that there are times, you know, as we're, we're talking about this, right, there is some shock factor when you see the inside of an animal and there can also be a lot of healing and connection that can happen and mm. a couple of two different experiences one is and I think you'll appreciate this one of my favorite things to do when we're doing a butchery demo for a large group is to take apart a knee and allow anybody who has had issues with their knees yeah. to visualize what is a meniscus or an ACL and to see those cruciate ligaments as they come in the tibial plateau and the way that the patella fits so perfectly and, Why, and to yeah. get that opportunity. And the other thing I, I really like to demonstrate, and this can be really powerful, it can also bring a lot of things up for people, is that when we're doing on-farm harvests where we mm -hmm. take the life of an animal and we gut it in front of people, is to take the lungs and to mm. re-inflate them using my own breath. And it's it's a very stunning process to kind of get this peak of this ghost of biology, right? Because what's happening isn't, isn't what a breath would be. You know, I most recently did this with a bison. And so that's going to be 12 of my breaths to fully inflate <laughs> lungs. But it gives us an opportunity to see just the power of that expansion yeah. and to give a visual to what it is to truly take a deep breath. Hmm. Yeah. So I just, it's, it's one of my favorite things to share a little peek inside of our biology. Yeah. And I think I have a strong stomach for this stuff because I grew up in the ER, not ER, the OR, I should say operating room, um, as a little girl with my dad doing, you know, routine surgeries with animals, you know, spays and dog neuters and, but also, um, I would be there if he was doing an exploratory with an animal that had passed, mm. you know, in the, in the, um, another room in the big, you know, bucket tub. And he'd be just taking out all the organs, like trying to find the tumor, trying to find what was wrong. Yeah. Um, and so it, I don't want to say it hardened me, but it, it, I just saw very early on, like what is inside of us. And I, I do believe it's an important thing to know that. I also think that's why that uh, exhibit Body Worlds was so powerful. Yes. You know, and how weird is it that we live as humans and we never know what's in us? I think, too, for, for people that have experienced disconnection with their body or dysregulation mm -hmm. with their body, that having that visual component often helps that inner connectivity. I know that yeah. this has been the case for me to be able yeah. to, to visualize that in myself, to be able to see my lungs in situ and what it means to to sort of expand them and have that oxygen exchange as, as they blow up and to feel my diaphragm drop and to know that mm -hmm. that is held in place by muscles and, and 
all of these different fascia and sinew is really helpful for me. Yeah. So tell me about your journey from this switch and what was going on with your health. I know that your health kind of came to a, uh, we could say a ground zero Mm -hmm. later in your teens, but give us, give me, give everyone the full, full view to the degree that you would like to share right now. Should we start in childhood or should we start at that kind of rock bottom? Let's start with the rock bottom and then let's go back. You know, it's funny. I think there were actually several different rock bottoms Mm -hmm. for my health. And I think the first one really came in my late teens. I had been a vegetarian since age five and was really experiencing a lot of gastrointestinal issues, Mm -hmm. a lot of fatigue and some mood regulation. I I had a lot of anxiety. I had Mm -hmm. some depression and that was really an impetus for me to begin eating meat the first in the first time. And I had a, another that I think was a deeper rock bottom mm. in my late twenties after I had started a business and been running it for four or five years. I found myself incredibly burnt out. I had um, quit using drugs and alcohol, but had previously used drugs and alcohol as things had become very intense. And I was Mm. looking to escape the financial pressure and the pressure of running a business. And I had quit that and sort of started on this journey of regaining my health. I I really wanted Mm. to re-nourish myself after this sort of two-year period of... Mm -hmm of burnout and found that I was getting increasingly more tired. And Mm. this led up to the point where we eventually moved from where we lived in Denver, where our butcher shop is to a farm in upstate New York. And I could scarcely get out of bed. Mm. So I would kind of go from the bed to the bath and maybe have two or three hours of the day where I could work or really focus on much of anything. And I think that was my true rock bottom bottom. in health. And this was three, three years ago. Oh, that recent, that recent. Yeah. So you're, that was when you were 28, when you hit the rock or I mean, it was kind of happening throughout, I would say, ages 28 to Mm -hmm. 31. I'm 34 now. And so that that real deep rock bottom three years ago, I Mm -hmm. was a little bit after turning 30. Mm -hmm. And I was struggling in a lot of different ways. And there were a lot of other symptoms, too. Very achy joints, Mm -hmm. a lot of gastrointestinal issues, Mm -hmm. uh, just terrible stomach aches that really prevented me from living my life at all. I was, I was completely shut down, completely frozen and very sick. So what, what was, if I go back, I'm going to jump a bit back to when you were in your, um, the teenage years, Mm. was it, cause I know there might be someone listening saying, well, was she an unhealthy vegetarian? Is that Mm. why? Maybe you've been asked that question before. What I haven't, would be your answer? actually. Oh, well, there you go. I love that. I haven't been asked that question. You know, what was going on from five to those late teens? And then we'll get into the trauma stuff. Yeah. From a food pers- <laughs> I was like, from a food perspective? Let's do food first, and then we'll go yeah. to, the, to the relationships and the dysregulation. You know, I think I was a healthy-ish vegetarian, and there are a couple of factors here. Number one, I, I was a child, and I don't think that my parents, who, who cared about healthy food, mm-hmm. I don't think that they really had a concept of what being a healthy vegetarian looked like and right. having the right balance of protein mm-hmm. in my diet and the right amino acid complements mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. ample amounts of B12 and some of those other vitamins and trace minerals that we get from meat. But I I wasn't a a terrible vegetarian either. And I think as this kind of 
went into my teen years, I did what a lot of teenagers do. And I survived on things like cereal and Mm -hmm. a lot of carbohydrates and and more processed foods that probably were not conferring a lot of health benefits to me yeah. nor supporting that healthy vegetarian lifestyle as it were exactly and then you know so you shifted to eating animal products um went through your 20s and then hit rock bottom and i think this is important because as you and i were talking about before we pressed record there is no one thing that will cure everything in one system it is a conglomeration of practices yes there might be food but also relationships healing yes. environment all these things so again i don't want this to sound like we're saying to heal your chronic illnesses you got to become nope. a butcher like kate that's nope. not what we're here definitely saying. not yeah <laughs> i think that we any any time we're looking at a whole person, we need to remember that the sum of you know the the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, mm-hmm. and that we are sometimes in illness this constellation of symptoms, and this constellation of environmental factors, whether that's the trauma from our childhood or where we live or chemical exposure, mm-hmm. and n- there is no single solution just like there is no single problem really these things don't happen in isolation no they don't and um just before we started to record uh my husband seth whom you know of and many listening to this know who he is he was i think answering some questions in one of our forums online And someone had come across one of my Q and A's that I had done in one of my courses. And I was actually quoting Matthew, I think it was, I think it's Matthew Walker. Who's the sleep, Mm -hmm. sleep expert. Is that the right name? Yeah. Matthew Walker. Yeah. He's great. And he is. And, um, I was introduced to him through Joe Rogan's podcast because I know that's the best place to go to get the full long history and so i i think it was like of course three hours probably long and it was great you know i would say that a little bit of it might be outdated because you know the science changes but that's not a big deal but what the person had asked and it's a valid question um because they follow me they asked is this going to conflict with the circadian biology elements that you are teaching through some of the experts namely carrie bennett um sarah kleiner Corey Gazvini. And I said, well, don't try not to worry about that. There's going to be important information from Matt Walker's talk, like the influence of alcohol on sleep, the influence of sleep deprivation and how terrible that impacts our physiology. Um, And then, yeah, he also mentioned that it's good to get morning light as you know, through glass. And we know we want to get morning light or any light for that matter with at least a crack of the window. There needs to be that ray, that photon that comes through. Yes. If not outside. Exactly. Preferably outside or sitting on your porch, et cetera, without sunglasses, no contacts, no glasses. And so, you know, this is one part about being an observer of science and also in the world of human health and of course you it's human health and environmental health soil health animal health there isn't one thing but there's going to be lots of things from different people and then you have to amalgamate it into what works for you yes you know i like glass of wine i'm not going to not drink that from time to time worrying about my sleep exactly right we're bio individual is something Mm -hmm. that i always like to remind people right the confluence of factors that make us us Mm -hmm. uh lend something very unique to our biology and to the levers that we are going to need to pull to heal and within that there's not going to be a single person with the answer there is not going to be a single science 
with the answer and that is something that is evolving and I mean even as you were just saying this I just listened to a podcast on Rick Rubin's podcast which I think is called Tetragrammatron it's a a hard one I don't know if I got that right (laughs) uh with with Andrew Huberman and Jack Ah, Cruz I wondered about that one (laughs) this really interesting conversation of two people that have a very different understanding and very different elements of and I'm going to put this in quotes the science Mm -hmm. coming together to have a conversation about where they might line up and where Matthew Walker having that viewing morning light through glass well maybe there's something else to that and I think that Mm -hmm. just like for our bodies where we are this constellation this confluence of all these different factors and we have to look at that through a holistic context Mm -hmm. talk a lot about this in regenerative agriculture looking at things holistic context and so when you're looking at an ecosystem or you're looking at even just the soil food web you're looking at something that is incredibly complex it has all of these different players and factors in relationships Mm -hmm. that are being built to give health to the greater whole and we are no different than than that soil food web or than that ecosystem and so looking at that holistic context of all those factors is really important in my mind it is important um and when i did see that those three were going to do a podcast together and they've done it and it looks like it's out on the airwaves so we'll have to check it out um i remember sharing and i said wow these worlds are colliding that's a very good sign very good sign um more than i think oh i'm getting tingles in my head as i say this more than i think people might realize they think it's three cool dudes you know with this history but the fact that an artist businessman manager an artist and somebody who has written a lot about creative work Yeah. yeah so that uh huberman who's pretty hardcore science but you can tell he has got a spiritual kink to him and he doesn't really talk about it and then i mean why would he be having a chat with cruz you know and ruben and then cruz whom is a neurosurgeon just for the people who don't know dr jack cruz neurosurgeon and now really into the quant he's really the godfather of, of quantum bringing, of quantum health out there yeah um and them coming together to me is like old school philosophers meeting around the campfire, meeting in the alchemy lab yes. and talking about their stuff. Yes. And they're getting out of their silos. And I think that this is one yes. of the most important things. You have Huberman, who is very much in academia, mm-hmm. in this ivory tower discipline that's very in line. You have Jack Cruz, who's very much a rebel mm-hmm. within the Western medical complex and within his viewpoint in in sort of that more academic ivory tower lens of science. And you have a creative. and they are leaving their silos and they are willing to have a conversation. And within that episode, I think Huberman gives a master class in humility and oh. curiosity and being willing to come to the table with an open mind. Yeah. And I think that it is really beautiful and it absolutely harkens back to the days of having philosophers or artists in a salon sharing ideas and I think Mm -hmm. that we have actually lost a lot of that sharing and exploring and getting curious and getting outside of our disciplines and outside of our dogma in order to begin to synthesize what we what we all know and maybe come a little bit closer to some really salient points. What excites me is that it is them whom are older than us, Huberman not by much, but Cruz definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, A mentor once said to me, Kate, a Feldenkrais mentor, when I was seeing all of the fighting and all of the 
pettiness and ego within um, it was my Feldenkrais communities trainers nobody wanted to collaborate and if someone had a really good idea it was like people were afraid of it because that meant it was going to take money away from them mm. and uh, Jerry Carson it was who said this to me he said Irene you're just going to have to wait for all us old people to die and then you young people can actually do something with this amazing work Wow, that's I a, cry. it powerful. That's really up, powerful. Yeah, and sad. And sad because he he saw it. He was uh, Moshe's assistant, Moshe Feldenkrais's assistant for quite a while, over a decade, I'm sure. And he's well into his 80s, late 80s now, maybe, still alive, doing well, living on Maui, living the simple life, you know comes in to teach when called, but isn't interested in the politics of trying to further the method from what I can tell at least. And he's, he's got the ability to look at it from the inception to now and just go, there's this beautiful body of work and it's not going to where it should go. You know, a recent friend, best friend, just started experimenting with some Feldenkrais work and she was blown away. She's like, how come this isn't more well known? I'm like, well, let me tell you. <laughs> it's less about the power of the work and it's more about the politics of the work. And I do feel that the fact that you and I are having this conversation, we're obviously on other sides of the continent, but very different backgrounds. You do a very different type of work than me, but we're interested in the same things. Mm -hmm. Just like Huberman Cruz and um, Ruben are interested in the same things. There's a reason why, why Rogan has those guys on, you know, Absolutely. interested in the same things as controversial as some might think it is. It's like, we're just interested in the same fucking things. Mm -hmm. We want humanity to survive and thrive and, and have fun doing it and also heal our stuff. And I think that this is where novelty is going to come out, where mm. some surprising outcomes as mm. we put different minds from different backgrounds and different disciplines together yeah. that have the same interests and a healthy curiosity for finding some of those overlaps or some of those dark spaces that we want to shine a light on. Mm -hmm. And we need a lot more of that because right now, I, I think, like you said, very siloed and very outside of the idea of collaboration, mm -hmm. very much built in the spirit of competition. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are honestly, a lot of factors from a, a historical standpoint that bring us into this space where, where everything is competitive and mm -hmm. siloed and mm -hmm. isolated from one another. Mm -hmm. And I, whether you're looking back to Descartes separating mind and matter and sort of having this looking at the mechanization of everything, you have, mm -hmm. you have Newton and Newtonian mechanics that sort of break everything down into their individual parts. Mm -hmm. And this leaving of our very cyclical nature as we experience nature and the cycles that are there, whether it's the cycles of the moon or the cycles mm -hmm. of the seasons or just mm -hmm. a cycle of a day in a mm -hmm. circadian rhythm sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and move towards a linear model. And if everything is aligned, then everything is also a race. It's also a competition and yeah. it is reductive. And it's not looking at the idea that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It's just looking at the parts. We have a, a cardiologist that's looking at the heart and a neurologist that's looking at the brain and a gastroenterologist that's looking at the gut and never the three shall, shall meet or intermix. And discuss, yeah. Yes. I remember Ruben said, I think it was on Rogan's podcast, I'm really paraphrasing this. He said people have a misinformed idea of what collaboration is. Mm. And I remember what he said was so profound. I had my students that I was teaching at the time listen to this interview. And it was something around um, 
Collaboration is about furthering forward. And if that means that one person's idea is actually better, I hope I'm getting this right, <laughs> then we take that. It, and it doesn't mean that the other people are dismissed. No. And um, recently I had a nutrition expert on, on my channel, Jessica Ash, who's really about just eating for our bodies, nourishing ourselves, not depriving, not eating in a survival based way, always keto, always carnivore, like you get it. Mm -hmm. And I knew that there would be some comments that of like eye rolls, like, oh my God, here's another diet advice. Here's another way of eating. Yeah. And actually, if you listen to the, the talk, it actually isn't about a way of eating. It's about nourishing ourselves but it's also a sign that we have progressed a little bit further and we, we're like okay this these dogmatic ways of dieting don't work even the ones that have helped people heal from significant mm -hmm. maladies they can be therapeutic ketosis can be therapeutic going on a fast can be you know therapeutic yeah. eating nothing but fruit could be keto um therapeutic for a, a small period of time but it's this ability to know okay that is like a, a medicine for a moment it's not forever mm -hmm. and i i'm like i'm seeing the progression i'm like well this is good that we're talking about this now um because we wouldn't have talked about this 10 years ago or 20 years ago no, and I, I think that those are stepping stones and they're mm -hmm. beautiful, again, therapeutic tools. And I think that they have lent some new ideas to the space. And mm -hmm. as we begin to integrate some of those things, as mm -hmm. we begin to find some synthesis between some of these different ideas and pull a little bit from here and a little bit from there, mm -hmm. I think we start to see a little bit more of a, a bigger picture emerge mm -hmm. and something that again, less siloed, less dogmatic, more in collaboration and relationship. Mm -hmm. And I also think that we see this collaboration and relationship modeled for us in an ecosystem, right? Yeah. Inside of the soil, we see all of these different characters and players come together, these micro animals and micro mm -hmm. arthropods and bacteria and mycelium and these fungal networks mm -hmm. and earthworms all collaborating to, to find something greater than the whole. And I think that it has been a gift for me to get to experience you call it regenerative agriculture or or just a holistic view of nature and ecology to be able to see this spirit of collaboration. Could you define regenerative agriculture for those who mm -hmm. have no, you know, again, I'm not expecting everyone to understand the agricultural world industry or regenerative farming. So uh, for someone who doesn't know the difference between what you and your husband do on your farm compared to something else how would you define these things just so we can educate people on that yeah i think at its simplest regenerative agriculture is really trying to mimic the systems that we see in nature mm -hmm. and when they're not being interfered with by us is, is how i'm gonna yes. put this and so yes. so finding some some mimicry of those systems mm -hmm. and so a really good example of this is bison on the north american continent mm -hmm. you have a co-evolution of the animal bison which is a ruminant it has a four chambered stomach that is uniquely designed to digest plant matter to digest yep. grass and then you have grasslands so 40 percent of north america used to be covered by grasslands and at the time it sequestered more carbon than the rainforest it was a very wow. beautiful ecosystem and bison and grasslands and and this is pretty simplistic but we're gonna we're gonna go That's with fine. this co-evolved together, which means that they need one another and that there is a symbiosis that happens between this 
mammal and this ecosystem where the grass is giving the bison all of this nutrient density, all of this nourishment, and that's coming from relationships inside the soil too. Mm -hmm. And this bison in turn is providing urine and um, fecal matter that is giving micro microbes back to the soil that mm -hmm. is providing moisture in a really arid arid yeah. place and helping the nutrient cycles of those plants and also pressing seeds into the soil acting as a pollinator and mm -hmm. so they need one another and so mm -hmm. within re regenerative agriculture it's looking at how can we create these mutually beneficial relationships inside of an eco of an ecosystem in the in the mirror of nature and how nature would create those relationships and this is sort of opposed to what we see on the other side what i would call conventional agriculture yeah where you see a lot of monocropping. And I bring up monocropping in particular because I think that this can apply to both crops that we eat or that we use as feed for animals. These are corn, soy, wheat, but we also monocrop things like kale or lettuces avocados. or avocados, strawberries. Mm -hmm. And so we see these these single crops being grown that could also be a single crop of beef, honestly. When you're looking at a concentrated animal feeding operation or a CAFO, mm -hmm. you're just seeing all the all the all all these cows that are eating feed that's been grown and imported into that space. Yeah. And nothing is in relationship, as no. it were, with anything else. There is no symbiosis there is no reciprocity there is just a single thing that is being grown in an extractive way and mm -hmm. is being grown in favor of efficiency and in favor of yields mm -hmm. when you describe that um having grown up and going to the farm as a kid um dairy farm was was what my my father's family were that was their lineage and it wasn't active when i was a kid it had been sold but there was still a hobby farm and we would go to the the big dairy farm where there were still you know friends that were doing that as their profession and i never really liked it <laughs> you know other yeah. other than playing in the hay bales in the barn you know finding kittens and that like i didn't like seeing all those cows crammed in i, I just i didn't like it Right. No, it doesn't feel I, good. And I and I was too young to understand why. Um, and then when I watch and, and hear about what you're saying with the bison and the grass and, and, and that interaction, it just it's like there's a breath that comes to me and it parallels what I also see in the healing world. Like you said, you've got the cardiologist for the heart and the, the gastroenterologist for the guts and the rheumatologist for the autoimmune condition. Now, I also will say if you have a true heart defect and you need to see a cardiologist, then go to the cardiologist. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Um, but I did a piece a while back titled, Are You Monocropping Your Healing? <laughs> because it really dawned on me as I got to know you and listen to you and, and kind of, we could say it's a trend that this regenerative agriculture is the cool thing and we need to come back to that. And the question is, is it, is it can it be scalable and all these things that come up and okay. But we, we're doing this in our healing too. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we reserve the movement and the awareness for that one hour at the end of the day mm -hmm. of our work day. We yes. reserve rest for maybe the weekend or most likely the two weeks of holiday that we are allowed by our employer. As opposed to how can you be aware when you are at work, when you are doing your dishes, when you're doing all these things, there's so much opportunity to regenerate yourself in the midst of your work day, but it's never thought about. And that, as you know, is one big thing I'm wanting to teach my students is how can 
how can you put all this into one pot and not be perfected at it, but do the best you can to bring in some awareness when you are in the most aware situation, you know, where you want to disconnect. Mm -hmm. How can you bring in awareness as you're answering emails? You know, can you, can you breathe? Are you feeling your bum? Are you, are you connected with what you're doing? Are you waiting to be done with that? Mm -hmm. So I think I almost sometimes wonder, Kate, if we've accepted this mono cropping agriculture just in many ways, because we're doing that with our lives in all these different ways. Yes. I mean, I think that we see all these mirrors. It's sort of like a fractal, right? Mm -hmm. Where, where each individual is a reflection of the whole and the reflection is an emergent property from a group mm -hmm. of individuals. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, we see on multiple levels what is possible through regeneration in the same way yeah. that we see on multiple levels how trauma and how, oh, our, our fractured relationships with, with self, with our families, with our environment are being manifested in some of these bigger things. And I think it's mm -hmm. bi-directional mm -hmm. in both, in both a positive and a negative light. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. What struck me when I was listening to Will Harris, whom I know you mentioned before we started, I think you've, have you done a show with him? Yeah, we yet? did an episode together. Okay, okay we'll put that up. Um, and this, this will actually tie into healing and the nervous system and your story, which I want to get back to around childhood. The thing that was like the mic drop for me when he was talking, um, it was through Joe Rogan. Um, he said, you know, the most, the most miserable people I see, how did he say it, are the, the young folk who are, who are trying to be farmers like me. So what he, what he said was, I'm doing this to save my farm, to yeah. have my employees be paid, to save my little plot, my like I'm here to basically mm -hmm. save white house pastures. Cause the, the talk was, are you, you trying to save the world? Are you trying to help the environment? And he's like, no, I'm just trying to save white oak pastures. And then he went into why, and he said, when I meet young folks who are trying to farm in the way I have been for the last 20 years, I believe he's been doing it in this regenerative way, mm -hmm. they're miserable. And he said, they're miserable because they're doing it, trying to save the world. They're not doing it with the right intention of it's just a job. It's just what I do. And he said that, and it was like the jackpot went off in my brain because there are many people who are wanting to get into the nervous system work and wanting to be healing trauma coaches and therapists because they see how much the world is struggling and they want to save the world. And I, I'm like, wow, that's the same parallel because a lot of those folks I see are struggling and they're really not enjoying it. It's thick, heavy work. And for me, it's just a job. Hmm. Do I enjoy it? Yes, I wouldn't do it. But I, I don't wake up thinking, okay, who am I going to save today? Hmm. That's really interesting. I'm letting that settle for a minute and okay. reflecting on my own experiences. I'd be curious to know how that lands considering you are in that world of regenerative farming. Yeah. I think that I think that it's interesting because I think that I see this too, that there is a heaviness and a weight for some of the mm. younger generation in really wanting to catalyze change and not knowing mm. how to go about that. Right. And I think that I experience that weight myself. And I think that the action of being here in relationship with my farm and 
having the ability to observe and to steward change on that individual mm-hmm. level yeah. gives me a sense of action in a space where I want to to see more change happen. And I often find myself, especially within the context of my Mind, Body, and Soil podcast, really wanting to enact change on a greater level and to bring storytelling to people. And I can get lost in that heaviness. However, there is a sense Mm -hmm. of being in service to something Mm -hmm. and to being in collaboration and connection with a group Mm -hmm. of people Mm -hmm. and so what i'd say because i think that i do sometimes fall into that trap of wanting to save the world sure is that the most important thing is that you are finding relationship and connection and collaboration within that feeling Mm -hmm. so that you are redistributing that weight and you have a network, right? Like this yeah. inside of a inside of the soil food web, we call this mm-hmm. a web or a network mm-hmm. because there are many nodes and many people working together. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it's a little bit of a both and. Yep. And to be clear, you know, I'm not cold hearted and don't want people I don't, to get better, right? Oh, I don't think that at all. No, I'm, I'm not saying that so much for you, but for my followers who are like, their jaws just dropped. I'm like, what? I, you're not, you don't care. It's, I do care about the work. Of course I wouldn't do it if, but there, I think what you just said is important. The, the collaboration, the co-creation, because mm-hmm. not one person should be responsible for saving the planet. Yes. In my opinion, there yes. is no one power or force we all have to co-create together and and then sometimes we have to take a break and not think about it yes i think that that is critical i also and i think this bears mentioning i think that there has been a lot of corporate america Mm -hmm. that has put the onus of change on the individual that Um. it is your job to recycle, to not use disposable straws, to (laughs) get an electric car. And I I won't unpack any of these specific things. (laughs) However, there has been a massive marketing campaign to sort of distract and to put that onus back on the individual. And so I think it is Mm -hmm. good to also be Mm -hmm. aware of the forces that are colluding to make you Mm. feel a certain weight within society that is not yours to bear. Yeah. It's too much for one person to think that, that they are responsible for all those pieces. Yes. Your own system. Yes. Your immediate family. Yes. Maybe the handful of close connections. Yes. Um, but it, it, it is, it is, unsurmountable what I find the younger generation are being told and a lot of them are in doomsday not yes. knowing what's going to happen yes um, and that more than I more than I realized recently I was with some younger kids 20 uh, year olds uh, children of friends and I'm like hey lighten up it's okay you know <laughs> like yeah there's some there's some pretty bad stuff but there's also a lot of good stuff happening too yeah And you know better than anyone how to describe the way in which fear disconnects us from our own bodies and I think from one another and pushes us into silos or places of feeling isolated and alone. And feeling like we can't act. Yes. So there's almost this tug of war. The fear is being dosed out, which then, I mean you can override that and push and override till you burn out and as you did. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also paralyzes us, puts us into procrastination, into resistance. And then that's not good either. No, no. Um, speaking of fear, tell me about your childhood. (laughs) I think this is a great place to start actually. Yeah. I think this conversation (laughs) really dovetails into this. Mm -hmm. 
the more I've been thinking about how to contextualize my childhood as mm. a part of my story, the more I think it actually comes back to this idea of connection. Yeah. And as a child, I grew up in a household. My parents were older mm. and my, they were both alcoholics at different points during my childhood. My mother really struggled with some mental health issues mm -hmm. and death was something that was really present and it was oh. present in that my, my father had a chronic illness and was dying for most of my childhood. Mm. Uh, my mother struggled with some suicidal ideation that she would share with me and mm. introduced this idea of death and as a kid, I was also very, both the sort of double-edged sword of being very curious and very afraid of mm. death. And this would manifest as a sort of obsession at times. And to give an example of this, I would mm. watch the scene where Bambi's mother gets shot over and over and over again, wow. trying to understand something mm. around, around age four, age five. And I couldn't connect. Mm. I struggled to connect with my peers at school. I did not know how to talk to other kids, how to be in relationship with other kids. Right. I was incredibly isolated and felt very ostracized, very mm -hmm. other as a kid. Mm. And when I went home, all I wanted to do was disconnect from the intensity that I was experiencing in, in my house with my parents mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. as an only child was also pretty alone in that space. Yeah. And so there was a lot of fear and a lot of disconnection and a lot of chaos. And one of the things that I really came to was I wanted to find some semblance of control. Mm. And one of the few things that I felt like I could control was what I ate. Of course. And this is how I landed on becoming a vegetarian. I had mm -hmm. this realization as I began to be able to abstract as a child that the meat that I was eating was coming from animals and that those animals had to die mm -hmm. for me to consume them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, this is a way that I can avoid death, that I can avoid the fear that I am experiencing everywhere I turn. Yeah. And so that was when being a vegetarian began. But as I went through to about age seven or eight, when things became very intense at home, I started experiencing debilitating anxiety, an inability to get out of the car and go to school. I was mm -hmm. terrified that my mother was going to die mm. uh, or, or to as, choose. As you would yeah. if, for her telling you these things. Yeah, or to makes choose complete, to die. Yeah, yeah, makes complete sense. And would leave me with my, my father who was ill and I didn't feel like could take care of me. And, yeah. and I really struggled to go to school. I was struggling with a lot of gastrointestinal issues mm -hmm. and eventually wound up in various psychiatrists and psychologists office offices mm -hmm. in order to look at all these ways that I wasn't really able to connect with life and by the time I was eight, I was on adult levels of various psychiatric medications. Mm. I think by the time I was 13, I had been on close to a dozen different ones trying to find, wow. and I'm going to put this in really big quotes, the right one. Right. And what I kept hearing in these doctor's offices was that they didn't understand why I wasn't connecting with my peers and this idea uh -oh. that there was something about me that was broken. And this, this really got reiterated to me yeah. as a child. And I don't remember, and I've tried to remember lately, mm. I don't think anybody asked me what was going on at home. home. 
they had no context no for these symptoms symptoms being anxiety and depression depression quick question and then of course the physical symptoms too yes was it your school teachers that that paved the way to get you into these medical doctors or do you remember it was both it was a conversation okay. between parents and teachers okay. i had missed so much school that it had I become see. an issue and i was so withdrawn at school yeah. from my peers that they had noticed this being a problem i also had periods where i would be nonverbal Ugh. and so this was a conversation between parents and teachers got it wow and so this went on for a while, right? This this medication, um, mm-hmm. and I mean different antidepressants, eventually some antipsychotics, mm-hmm. and uh, nothing really helped. Nothing really changed or moved yeah. the dial. Yeah. And around seventh grade, um, my father's health had deteriorated quite a bit. I was 13 and the school that I was at had, I was so uncomfortable and I really wanted to go to a different school. Mm -hmm. And in order to get into this alternative school that I had found, I had to do sort of a battery of, of tests. Mm -hmm. Um, there were some IQ tests and just assessments and, and valuations. And during that time, they diagnosed me with Asperger's. And it's interesting that out of, out of all of the diagnoses that I received in childhood, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about diagnoses, this one didn't really stick as much, but it was all about this inability to connect. Yeah. And, and that really formed, I think, the space from which I come from now in my work as a desire to become more connected and to explore mm-hmm. modes of connection. Mm-hmm. So I want to keep going with the story, obviously. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many times I've heard a similar story, different of course, but similar where little person is struggling all these specialists, Mm -hmm. usually medication, thinking about one student in particular, and no one ever thought to ask what was going on at home. I really hope that's changed. Oh, me too. It breaks my heart. it, It is tragic. It is, one might say, criminal that the school system if a school system now can't see that, then I think it's better. I do feel it's getting better. But then of course the question is, what do you do with that? Because I know that if the parents aren't interested and seeing what's going on and why their kid is like that is maybe because of something going on. Now this doesn't mean, you know, maybe there was a surgery when little one was young birth trauma and the parents really were attuned and connected that's different but when there is abuse when there's neglect when there's chronic illness you got the double whammy kate with chronic illness and mental illness from your mom yeah so that that is a very intense ace score right there yes right and i know that you and i have talked about the adverse childhood experiences yeah. score and looking at at the work of Robin Robin Morse Carr scared sick I have it right you got it yeah scared sick one of the best books on the ACE study really incredible yeah scared sick we'll, we'll link that below for those who haven't seen or read it better than trying to read actual ACE papers <laughs> don't don't try to go to the CDC's website and read the ACE study it's it's been going on for decades so it's pretty complex, but they condense it into that book in such an easy to read way with compassion and and the problem, of course, and how insanely big this situation is. Yes. Um, all right, so here's what's interesting. You can connect, clearly you <laughs> can connect. 
<laughs> it's your living right now. How crazy it is. And thank God you broke out of that cage. Yeah. Yes. And and that is what it was. It was a it was a bucking of the system and it was one of the things I'm I'm really thankful for is a sort of rebellious nature in me in that I really wanted to defy labels. And I, I tell people for my eighth grade graduation, um, what ended up happening was I got into that school, but my, my father died and I ended up staying at the same school for a variety of reasons. And for my eighth grade graduation, I was given a copy of civil disobedience and told that I was one of the most difficult kids that had ever gone through there, which I appreciate and, and take as a great compliment and and this would sort of dovetail too into, you know, I left home at, at 16 and I lived in punk houses and I found the punk rock music scene where I felt very at home for the first time in a band of misfits. I, I really suited me. And I think, again, there, there was this idea that you can't put a label on me and you can't define me and you can't put me in a box and I think that, again, that rebellious nature had something to do with my decision as a 16-year-old to then go off of all these psychiatric medications and to search for different healing modalities and different ways of connecting. Did you go off those all cold turkey? Yes, I did. Wow, lady. How, tell me what that was like. It is hard for me to remember what that was okay. like because there were electrical zaps in my brain <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, is the only way that I can categorize that feeling. It mm -hmm. felt like little tiny electrocutions. Yeah. And I just don't really remember that period. I remember some pain and fogginess and it's it's just all clouded that's amazing i i'm gonna say this right now as a disclaimer it's not recommended to do that no absolutely not um it can be very intense my sense is because you d even though you had chronic illness going on in your gut you were still young you had a bit mm -hmm. of youth on your side if it was 16 mm -hmm. and it sounds like you were with people of your own kind mm -hmm. so in you know the punk rock era like it's, i just recently revisited the violent femmes music I um, saw that on your story today, and I, and I was just and it, like, I love Irene. Well, and it just, I, I had forgotten how much that kind of music was part of my life back then. Mm -hmm. um, it was needed. I don't need it in the same way I did back then. Um, I grew up in the, you know, the Nirvana, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Beastie Boys, mm -hmm. hardcore, you know, that kind of music. Mm -hmm. um, and it there is something cathartic about kids having that at certain times and what you said i'll share something interesting i've worked with obviously many people who have siblings let's say and often the ones that would end up in my office with a very debilitating chronic condition which often was triggered by a life event that was huge like a car accident or the death of someone um, similar to your rock bottom i think the 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 business the burnout is what was the straw that broke the camel's back for you. And there's always usually one thing that does that for someone, but I'll never forget working with this one young woman who was having chronic pain as a result of a car accident, so we thought. And as I started to hear her history, her parents all were essentially useless. You know, they, they, I don't think they were alcoholics, but they were just not together. And so she was cleaning the house, she was paying the bills, she was taking oh. care of her brother, all these things and doing a real damn good job at it, which a young 12, 10 year old can do, eight year old can do. Yeah. Yeah. But it's unfathomable to it, but it, imagine it shouldn't them having to. Exactly. It shouldn't happen. And what is interesting is her brother or her sibling was the rebel 
he didn't he didn't care you know he, he was a nuisance to the parents he wasn't kind so in other words he was getting his fight out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he wasn't freezing and being the good kid and so when you mentioned you were the rebel like that in my opinion is probably a portion of what saved you from that situation mm -hmm. is you did disengage from that family and you found like you said these misfits mm -hmm. it's great yeah yeah, I'm really it comes with its consequences too, of course, with the drugs and alcohol and all that that I'm sure was within that world maybe. Or did there that happen was, later? And I wasn't engaged with it. That Isn't happened for me a little bit later. I I dabbled with some psychedelic drugs during that time, but that was yeah. really the extent of it. Hmm. Um and I love what you said because I think that that fight was really important for me during mm -hmm. that time. And I would find mm -hmm. a lot of freeze later in my story. Yes. Talk about that freeze. How oh. did that come through? Freeze happened a lot. So I started college at 16. So at the same time that I moved out, I also started college. And I didn't know how to navigate much in life and was quickly overwhelmed. I've always experienced a lot of overwhelm. I often relate to people that modernity feels very loud to me. And I, I don't mean loud in an auditory sense. There is just this sort of concert of sensation that I have troubles bringing into my body or grounding through my body and filtering. I don't really have a good filtering mechanism. I often tell people that I have this sort of leakiness to me, that I can feel other people's emotions really acutely and can feel the sense of different spaces and lighting and, you know, these things that we associate oftentimes with, and you and I have talked about this some too, sensitive people or, you know, those that are on this autism spectrum that I, I was diagnosed on. But in that, going to college and that overwhelm would really put me into a state of freeze. And I wouldn't know what to do. I actually ended up having, there was one semester where I was so frozen, I couldn't even drop a class. And I ended up taking an F for the class and it hurt my GPA because I was, I was too paralyzed by overwhelm to walk to the registrar's office and drop this class. It was actually quite, quite simple and I couldn't do it. And this followed me. That, that same story repeated in different iterations throughout the, you know, six years I spent in college. It repeated in business, whether they were things like emails or they were bigger conversations about financial components of business, where I would just be put into this total paralysis and freeze response. And as I started to get sicker and to move more towards that rock bottom, almost everything felt like something that was going to put me into that state of freeze and overwhelm. Your capacity was maxed out. Absolutely maxed out. And the analogy I often use, I think you know it, the swimming pool beach ball analogy with the, the balls in the pool. You had some craters and meteors in there that were just lodged into your pool. Yes. You know, um, you probably didn't understand, did you understand that that was freeze? Or did you just, did, was there a sense of this is just the way my life is? Hmm. Initially, I did not understand it was freeze. I quickly grew to recognize freeze, I would say around age 25, because it was such a strong component and because I had also begun to do a lot of research. I really wanted to heal. I was 
seeing various different therapists. I was reading a lot of different books and I felt in many ways that perhaps I could educate myself into a healed state. And I think that that probably will resonate with some people too. Yeah, I agree. And I think the education is super important, but then there's the need to practice as you've learned. Yes. So thank you for owning up to that. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Um, and and I and I will say kudos that you again Kate this is that fight. Like it it surfaced up again. It's like there needs to be something that I need to figure out so that I can get out of this. Yes. Freeze. And and there was a lot of fight and especially as I got sicker and I started seeking out what was going on inside of my body and for the first time in my life looking for a diagnosis. I had had this experience where a lot of diagnoses had found me uh, in in childhood in a way that I didn't feel like I had agency or that I had sought out or that put me in a box. But this time I really did want to better understand what was going on with my body and this led me into just massive amounts of research. I was tired and so I could lay in bed and read and read and read and seeing various functional practitioners, listening to podcasts. I went back and became certified as a nutrition therapist, learned everything about all of these different components, right? I I looked at diet, I looked at some nervous system work, I looked at emotional and sort of spiritual healing work, and was trying to put all of these things together And I I want to say this too, that that during this time, and one of the things that had attracted me to being in the regenerative agriculture space was that I had visited dozens and dozens of farms and ranches across the West where I got to see the incredible healing capacity of these ecosystems. That as this sort of biomimicry and co-creation took place, inside of these farms and ranches that you would see the reversal of desertification where you'd see more plants cover the soil you would see more animals that hadn't been present before uh, come into that ecosystem different birds and pollinators and you would even see something like a creek bed that had been dry for decades begin to run again And I knew that there was something in that, that I was just a reflection of those spaces. And so I was pulling all of these different levers, trying to find that holistic context in which I could heal. What led you to go to those farms? Because at that point you were not in, you were not farming yourself. No. So what part of that story have we not told? Yeah, so that was when I started eating meat again, which I was Mm. about age 20. I had become a vegetarian at five, and I had been really drawn to this idea. This was that first rock bottom, and I felt that meat might confer some, some health benefits for me, and it was something that I was craving. But the only way that I felt that I could eat meat was if I understood those systems. And so I wanted to visit farms and ranches and shake the hands of the people that were raising my food and get to see these animals and their relationship with the ecosystem and to be really connected, again, to that food system if I was going to participate in it. That's incredible that you had that insight at age 20. I'm just going to name that. It re- it really is. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm grateful for that girl. She yeah. did a she did a good job. Yes, she did, you know. Um and when you were describing those ecosystems and you know dry the dry creek beds filling up with water and I mean it just it mimics it's the biomimicry of what's going on in the nervous system with yes. stagnation and Mm. the lymph not being able to move and the digestion not going in the right direction and the the blood not being able to get to the head when you stand up quickly. Mm -hmm. I want to make that connection for people who are maybe new here or don't 
see these parallels to me at least and obviously to you and hopefully to others listening that natural ecosystem is our ecosystem and our physiology yes absolutely the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil that form these massive networks of connection that shuttle nutrients throughout the space and chemical messengers and Mm -hmm. electrical messengers like they are a nervous system inside of an ecosystem And I think that we see on all these different levels, these beautiful mirrors of what is inside of us, that Mm -hmm. the trees that, you know, respire, that transpire oxygen look like our lungs as we take in that oxygen and then surrender some of ourselves as carbon dioxide to nourish the plant matter around us, that there are these these mirrors and similarities and fractals within these systems. What was, um, so you're at rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Four years later, you're not. Yeah. What were the steps that you took um, that got you to where you are today? Yeah. Because it's quite, I mean, if we go back to that ecosystem, the wild, I'm also thinking of that that classic tale from Yellowstone, not the show. <laughs> <laughs> Let me be clear. Reintroducing wolves and the, the trophic. Yeah. 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 The park in, um, gosh, I'm terrible with my state. Is it Wyoming? Wyoming and Montana, yes. And Montana. Some I don't um, know. Like that story, and we'll, I'm sure I'll, I can find it. We can find it and link it. They re- reintroduced wolves. Can you just give a little snapshot of what occurred? I can. Please, because it's just so beautiful. It's and so then, beautiful. Yeah, it's so beautiful. So they reintroduced wolves in Yellowstone National Park. I, I don't know when it was. And there were a lot of effects in the ecosystem that they could not have anticipated. And this is part of what is called a trophic cascade. And it is how all these different parts are interconnected. And oftentimes a, a predator actually really sets the tone for that is really a big part of what moves these pieces. And so with the reintroduction of wolves, they saw things like the riverbanks begin to shore back up and to have less erosion. And this was because the deer, which now had a natural predator and the elk, would not eat some of the young willow shoots and things of that nature out in the open and would stick inside the forest instead. And this gave the beavers more material to work with as they could work as these little ecosystem engineers. And so, and and there were many more pieces of this, but that's just kind of one example of that reintroduction changed the behavior of the deer, changed the way that plants were growing, changed the access of, of different little mammals like beavers to change those ecosystems. That's great. Um, what would you consider then? I know that for you, it was the start was visiting farms and getting connected to the biological world in a different way with your healing journey. What was, what was that wolf? What, what was one of the things that, um, catapulted the, maybe let's say one of the bigger layers that you broke through if there is one. I'm not sure that there is one. I think that food, I think Uh, that nervous system. I think that my relationship to myself, and I Mm. think that some of this is nervous system and not outsourcing my healing to Mm. various people, which I did. There's a a lot of looking for an answer. And so in many ways, perhaps it was acceptance that there wasn't a single answer, that there wasn't a single diagnosis and accepting the complex constellation of factors that had gotten me to that place and the constellation of factors that were going to work to get me out of it. It's interesting, you know, because if we look at that Yellowstone example, it was one thing that shifted all those things. 
it'd be hard to know if we uh, if there was a bunch of things if it would have had the same effect who knows yeah but as you started to talk about that and as i started to reflect on my the students that i've had and hearing their stories you're right there is a con there's many pieces that confluence into mm -hmm. a massive shift or a massive mm -hmm. change um so for your you it's food the nervous system connection to self not outsourcing mm -hmm. um getting help when you need to continuing to educate yourself all those pieces yes yes and let me mm -hmm. say this too please because I think that something that is happening inside of that trophic cascade is that you are bringing all of the this constellation of characters and players back into relationship with one another. And so you are restoring the relationship between the beaver and its source material. You are restoring the relationship of the deer to the forest and to the open wetlands. You are restoring the relationship between predator and prey. And so while you are reintroducing one thing that might be influencing it, ultimately, I think what is happening is you are bringing everything back into relationship with one another. It's, it's bringing everything back into that harmony. Yes. That symbiosis. Yes. And I often actually come back to music in this. And I come back to this idea that we any any given diagnosis or any factor in our healing like we want a symphony we want there to be this harmony that there is going to be a, a wood section and a brass section and a wind section i'm going to do really poorly at, at naming sections but there are going to be all of these these different factors that just like you said are, are coming together at this confluence so what's your thoughts now on these labels, the one that you were given? I know you and I have talked about that privately to a larger extent, um, but how do you see that now? Where do you feel, if at all, if you are on any kind of spectrum? Um, wh where is that now? I know you've been writing a lot about this in your own time. Yeah. A lot of this came up. I'm going to take us back for just a second, if that's OK. I started exploring the idea of what is self and what is other. And I was diagnosed with an autoimmune condition in the scheme of this. I have autoimmune atrophic gastritis, maybe, uh, which manifests as pernicious anemia, curiously enough. And so this is an inability of the parietal cells inside of the stomach to make intrinsic factor, which is a binding protein for B12. And so it's really interesting that I was led back to meat all those years ago, because I think that my body was really seeking a particular nutrient. And, and this has been a big part of my healing journey. But I think that within that, there's been this question being diagnosed with autoimmunity, being diagnosed with Asperger's or autism spectrum disorder, the root word in both of those, autos is the Greek for self. And so autoimmunity is a resistance to self. It's an inability to recognize self. Autism is selfism. It is the practice of self, of, of inwardness. And I think in a lot of ways, we're in this crisis of self. I think that we have lost what it is to be a self in this world and to define that because I think that our self is defined in relationship, that we require proof of self in the way that we relate to everything else. And so when we touch something and we experience, you know, I'm, I'm reaching over to a, a flower that's on my desk here and we experience touching that petal, that petal is on the other side being felt, right? When I reach out to my husband and I touch his arm on the other side, he is, is feeling that touch. When I look outside onto my farm and I take in all, all the beauty of spring in bloom, it is 
that beauty that is that I am in relationship with that that lets me know that I can see that I have this experience of sight and I think that in many ways everything happens in relationship that we define ourselves as a concert of relationships and I think even within that one of the reasons that food is so so closely held and dogmatic for so many of us is that we breach what we consider the boundary of self as we bring fork to mouth and we put it inside of us it goes inside of our bodies and then as it's digested the constituent elements of our food diffuse across a one cell wall thick membrane and what was once other becomes self and yet for every one human cell in our body, there are nine cells that make up our microbiome. And so there is this fundamental symbiosis of relationship that we are experiencing that we are more other than self and this definition of self in relationship. And thinking about that really shifted what it meant to receive all of these diagnoses of an inability to connect so many years ago and to come home to an idea of connection and of relationship within an interconnected web of life and this constant transformation of matter where self and other are in this sort of dialogue at all times that our biology is being informed by our environment through our food, through light, through touch. And I don't know. I don't know if I <laughs> believe in a single diagnosis any more than I believe in a single cure. And I think that we are so often put inside of these little boxes and these parameters in these I mean it's a it's a monoculture right that we are just this one thing oh you're autistic you are somebody who suffers from depression you are somebody yeah, that suffers like, from anxiety you are this as opposed you are to this I often will say you know what would it be like to frame it you live currently with this yes and Yes, for now. And there is so much potential. And I think that, I don't know that I believe in these diagnoses in some ways because I think that they leave out context of the human. I mean, so much of what we talked about is these, this confluence of factors. And are we looking at that in people that are receiving these diagnoses? Exactly. I was reading a portion of a book weeks ago. I can't recall which. It was one of the the big books written by maybe Bessel van der Kolk or mm -hmm. Gabor Mate. I can't remember. But they were quoting um, Bruce Perry. I'm not sure if you're familiar with psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. He's he is a very interesting gentleman. Um, wrote has written a few books. One uh, Born for Love. One um, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog severe mm -hmm. childhood neglect stories is what he specializes in um and he's the psychiatrist that is often brought in after children are rescued from cults and he was the the guy that came in after the waco disaster um for example and he i was looking for a reference for add adhd that's what i was looking for mm -hmm. And in his, I'm not sure if it's a clinic or the work he does, he basically states, you know, the DSM, the Diagnostic, you know, Manual of Psychiatric Disorders mm -hmm. has just done, and I paraphrase, a huge disservice in many ways that we can't get into right now. I, um. <laughs> yeah, I have a I have a quote. I did a whole podcast exploring the origins right. of the DSM. Oh, beautiful. It's a, yeah. We'll get that in there in here. And what he said is we no longer use any of those labels. We don't 
we don't say this person we're in this camp because it's just not useful and he said we have found that adding these labels does nothing to to further treatment of these individuals it isn't important we don't need no. to know about it no and I don't understand fully the desire to put labels or to medicalize the human experience. Yeah. And this is something I've thought a lot about, that there is a pathologization, a medicalization of the human experience and looking at it and saying that you must exist on this, this bell curve or this spectrum yeah. and finding these delineations of, well, this is not normal, big quotes here, and labeling that with yeah. a diagnosis and it comes back to you mentioned Descartes you know Renee Descartes earlier in there's a book called Descartes error written by a neuro mm. neurologist Antonio Damasio that talks about the error of that I think there's a I think we it, there's many things there's Newtonian science Descartes um there's a problem let's fix it the water is contaminated let's clean it um you know very black and white and then we have this human that has this higher brain that can latch on to these labels. It's easy, but then it, 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 rob is too strong of a word, but it robs us of remembering that we are this whole creature. Yes. As you said, that's dependent on the environment, the food, the, the um, assimilation of the nutrients you just said, the, the, the excretion of the waste, all those things. I don't know how many people, Kate, ever actually land in that reality at this point in time. Like, of course, there are people that do, like you and I, we have that connection to Earth. But if we think about the 8 billion people on the planet and all the people that came before, I don't think many people went to their grave mm -hmm. having ever understood that they are connected to this universe, mm -hmm. multiverse, Earth. So it's easy, I think, to take that label because it doesn't demand asking more than just, oh, okay, this is it. What do I need to do? Mm -hmm. And, you know, no judgment. I also say that it's, it's no one's fault and it's everyone's fault that we're in this situation. Yeah. Um, so... You know, it's interesting, there's kind of an analog in agriculture when you look at holistic or regenerative systems mm -hmm. that you're never giving a single prescription for regeneration because mm -hmm. it depends on context. And so when you look at like, I think the work at the Savory Institute and ecological outcome verification illustrates this most clearly, but there isn't a looking at a piece of property and saying, this is what we do for every single piece of property. This is the problem with this land and this is what you're going to do. Instead, it's what is the context of this ecosystem? Is it dry? Is it wet? Has it been monocropped? Has chem have chemicals been applied mm -hmm. to it? And what is the context of the stewards that are managing that land and providing a holistic framework? And so it is not prescriptive no. in a one size fits all way. And I think that diagnoses can become that one size fits all. And I certainly understand as somebody who has sought out diagnosis and mm -hmm. has been on the other side that it does feel like it gives you some answers or some guidepost in what is a very dark experience of mm -hmm. chronic illness, of chronic yeah. pain. Yeah. I had one student who wasn't diagnosed with autoimmune, it was lupus, and I've talked about it on my channel, so her story is up for people to listen to. Selden is her name, we'll link that. But she actually, similar story to you, chronic stuff started really young, couldn't pay attention in school. Nobody knew what was going on. It ended up being abuse that nobody knew about. Um, but when she got her diagnosis, it was a godsend for the others in her world so that she could almost have a hall pass to be sick and to rest because she looked fine. Like there's nothing wrong with you. How could you be in pain? You know, you haven't had an accident. 
And so in that case, again, context, different situation. Yes. She needed that hall pass to say, hey, I, I got something going on with my system. Give me a break. Yes. And I, I think about that, like, what would it have been for me to communicate that autism diagnosis in college when I was overwhelmed? Right. Would there have been different help for me? And mm -hmm. times where I've wanted to communicate that this is actually, and so to be clear for listeners, this is the first time I have spoken publicly about this. Mm -hmm. um, and I did not tell anybody other than my husband about that diagnosis for 20 years. And wow. so the first time I told another human was actually this year. It was at the beginning of this year. Wow. Thank you and for sharing. I think that it would have made a difference at times. It would have felt easier at times to mm -hmm. kind of hang my hat mm -hmm. on that diagnosis. And in a lot of ways, I think it was that rebellion in me that didn't, didn't want that label and in some ways, and I, I'm curious what you think of this, I really wanted to rise above the challenge. My gut sense, Kate, is I'm glad you didn't. Only because, you know, the, the universe that you would have had might have been very different. Yeah. Because then people might have started treating you differently. Not to say that sometimes we don't need to express just like my other students had needed it. Yes. You know, um, I, again, each person is unique in their journey, their context, knowing you in the way I've gotten to know you just through these interactions online, I would say, I think it was probably a good decision to not share that with many people. Um, and you knew it for yourself. Yes. Yes. And I think in many ways it became something that I wanted to alchemize, that I wanted to find the strengths in it, um, that I wanted to find some challenge in it too. Yeah. And yeah. Did you want to read something from the DSM? It was a quote. Do you want me to? Yeah, yeah I can. <laughs> yeah, you got excited. Up. I saw you were looking for something. Yeah, I can pull it right up. Yeah. Um, I love this. So this is from Robert Spitzer, who was one of the main creators of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. Okay. And in an interview with the BBC that is absolutely worth watching, because there are so many quotes in there that talk about this, this DSM task force and the way in which they created this diagnostic criteria. Yeah. And it, it's worth looking into. So Robert Spitzer says, what happened is that we made estimates of the prevalence of mental disorders totally descriptively without considering that many of these conditions might be normal reactions, which are not really disorders. That's the problem because we were not looking at the context in which those conditions developed. That is the creator of the diagnostic statistical manual saying that. When, when was that interview from? Does I think it, it was the nineties. Okay. Well, you see, that makes me chuckle and it also is heartbreaking. Yes, both. Because it, it, it forms pretty much psychiatry and how they treat, diagnose, how they diagnose and treat. And as is said in the book, Scared Sick, and also in Bessel van der Kolt's book, when the, mm -hmm. um, the body that keeps the score and the other individuals who are in that posse of, you know, researchers and doctors who are really getting this work out there, the ACE study that this is trauma, these symptoms and, and diagnoses, every single diagnosis in that manual goes back to early childhood trauma. Yes. In some way, shape or form. Yes. That's a problem. <laughs> you know? That's a big Be problem. Because it goes back to you as that little kid, nobody asking what is going on at home. Um, so it almost is like when, you know, it'll be interesting for us to come back in 10 years to be like, what's going on with that manual now? You know, that, 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 that quote reminds me of all the other instances where we've seen one thing that's been stamped in become the trademark 
for a generation, generations of things not having full truth. I'm thinking about Ansel Keys yes. and the study that That's happened. A great example. With, you know, uh, you know, and how we're still working our way through that misinformation mm -hmm. and how wrong he was. And of course, we could have five hours talking about all the other instances where that stuff has been stamped as truth and nobody has went back to question the founder and what they were doing and their thoughts now yes. even. Yes, and has not left space again to come back to Rick Rubin and Cruz and yeah. Huberman, has not left space for people to come out of their silos and explore concepts that where they may or may not agree with one another mm -hmm. in these forums to further the idea of science. And we also mm -hmm. have to remember that science is inherently political, that it gets teased into these political movements as well. And mm -hmm. so there are no, uh, there are no, I don't know, the benchmarks in this that, that are immutable. There are no concepts that aren't subject to change, just like mm -hmm. we ourselves are beautifully and wonderfully subject to change and to transformation. Yes, ma'am. Anything else you want to share? Mm. I thought, I mean, I shared a lot. I, I, I can't think, think of, yeah, I think, yeah, <laughs> I can't think of anything that's, that's particularly there, but if you have any more questions, I am of course game. No, I, 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 I appreciate the full circle we've taken. Um, as you know, I wanted to share your story of healing. Um, I also wanted to share your story because I, I do believe your podcast is a very cool one, a very different one. Mm. So I want people to know about you and what you're doing. And it isn't just about butchering and no, meat. it's about, right? I want to be actually very clear. mostly not, um, exactly. <laughs> mostly not. Exactly. So exactly. Yeah. And it's called the mind, body and soil podcast. And we mm -hmm. explore all three of those things, sometimes through the lens of regenerative agriculture. But lately, mm -hmm. we've been delving a lot into history, right? Mm. Some of the history of some of these institutions. So the medicalization right. of, of us as humans, which I'll send you a link to that episode with James Connolly, mm. and into some philosophy and mm. exploring these sort of interconnections that we experience looking at where these fractures occur in the mm -hmm. way that we view the world looking some at hunter-gatherer societies and what they yeah. might what they might tell us about different modes of being with with nature and with each mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. um, and so deep explorations and long format real big deep yeah. dives the best kind the best kind, very much in the style of, of Joe Rogan. Um, and I want to speak to that too, because, you know, some people have noticed that I've stopped time stamping my long form podcasts and shows. And one of the reasons why is there's no quick fix in learning <sighs> and listening to conversation. And I will, you know, if someone is listening to this now, that means they have gotten through the one hour and 46 minutes. So thank you for those that have made it this far. Um, mm. The one thing I've learned in my 25 plus years of being in, if we could call it a health and healing industry, don't love that term, but that's what it is. I make a living doing this stuff is you need to be a scholar um, in this world and not just a scholar of healing, but a scholar of the world, the planet, the people, the things. Um, and I don't know if many people know how to do that anymore. Mm. And I do think that this long form podcast trend that has been occurring, while it might seem crazy compared to the fast paced, fast food media little bits, like, that is survival stress consumption yes. of information 90 seconds. 
Like, what is it like to put something like this on and listen and, and have it in the background maybe, and then you flirt back with it. And, and there is something that happens in our brain and in our body, I believe, when we take some time to really learn long form. And some do say that philosophy is the only true science that exist, mm -hmm. exists there was debate about physics and philosophy and I don't remember the, the context, but I'm like, Oh, I get that. You'll love my favorite, one of my favorite authors. Um, his name is Dr. Fridjof Capra mm -hmm. and he is a physicist, a quantum physicist who has done a lot of work in philosophical realms. And mm -hmm. I, he wrote a book called systems view of life about modeling ecosystems, mm -hmm. but he's well known for his work with a book called the Tao of physics, where mm -hmm. he explores the intersection of quantum mechanics and Eastern mysticism. And mm -hmm. it is not to be missed. And so, okay. uh, and that is very much the space I like to occupy on the podcast, somewhere yeah. in between philosophy and, and physics and ecology. Well, here's a good, another good little piece that you'll love. Um, I was recently in Europe, as I, as I mentioned to you, and I was hanging out with some colleagues in Austria, and one of them is highly connected. He's a somatic experiencing colleague so trained under Peter Levine's world and, and also movement and body and, and touch and body work. And he also has a very strong connection with um, Buddhism and many Rinpoches from mm -hmm. Nepal, Nepalese Rinpoches. Lots of meditation, lots of helping them facilitate their retreats, their spiritual retreats. And what has been happening over the last year or so, more and more, is these Eastern teachers are wanting him to educate the students on the biology, on the nervous system, on all the things that he and I share, the polyvagal theory, because they're seeing that you, you need to have that along with the spiritual Eastern mm -hmm. meditation side. It's not enough anymore to just sit because a person mm -hmm. doesn't know how to. Yeah. physically be in their body with all the things that are floating around so when he shared that with me a few weeks ago it was uh, very promising that similar to Reuven and Cruz and Huberman coming together I saw oh, it again yeah. in this discussion like wow the Rinpoche wants the lecture about the hardcore biology that is an amazing piece of progress in our world and in their world. Yeah. Yeah. That's interdisciplinary 100%. conversations coming yeah. out of our silos. I have to mention too, before we, before we hang up sure. too, that the 21 day nervous system tune up. Hmm. Speaking of being in our bodies, was one of those spaces and I actually think just the act of orienting as I was kind of going back over something today before we mm -hmm. hopped on just the simple act of experiencing that relationship with my body and my environment with my body and wherever that seat of self is really moved the dial for me this last it's been nine months since I initially took it, but I come back to it fairly often. Mm -hmm. But I think that that I have seen the biggest shift in the last year since starting the podcast and an even bigger shift in the last nine months since doing this work. And so thank, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I'm, I am thrilled that we connected and that we got to talk long form. I know. I'm sure we'll do it again. I'm sure we will. I, I love long form and I love what you said. I think it's important. My husband referred to 90 second social media as uh, disposable, disposable yes. media. And it's just, it doesn't feel good and it doesn't give us any space to unpack complex and mm -hmm. nuanced topics and to let stories unfurl. You know, a, a flower doesn't bloom 
instantaneously. There is a whole process for all of those petals to begin to unfold so that you can see that whole, all of that beauty. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that I appreciate the most about living in a rural space is time to go a little bit slower. I'll be joining you in that space in my own way over here soon. So yeah, can't wait to hear how that changes you. Yeah, it'll be good. We're still, we're going to still have city capacity, but I'm, I'm feeling that desire to be a little more connected, to be able to walk out my door and not be in dog poop. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Hear some frogs singing. Yeah. Frogs, deer, all the things. Um, we mentioned a lot of links and a lot of resources. We'll get all those up. Um, I have been on your show, I think one or two times, so two times, we'll link, two times. We'll link our discussions yep. in there as well. And my dear, it is a pleasure. Irene, it is always a pleasure. Thank you for making such a beautiful container for me to share my story. Mm, I appreciate you're it. You're welcome.